Okay, so let's start. So today we're gonna switch to topic to Ario again, and we're gonna briefly talk about exploration, right? And the model that we're gonna focus on is this very classic model called multi unbended which I will explain in a second. All right, so let's let's do a quick recap on what we did, uh, you know, before we were talking about imitation learning, right? So we ended we end the reinforcement learning section by, you know, summarizing this policy gradient method. All right, so let's record the most classic formulation, which we derived from this algorithm called reinforce. All right, so we can write the gradient of the objective function with respect to the parameters of our policy theta in this particular formulation, right? So the expectation is taken with respect to the trajectory sampled from your column policy, right? And you're weighting that by the reward, the total reward along that trajectory. And then you have the summation of the log likelihood of your gradient of the log likelihood of your policy, right? So that is equivalent to the gradient of the log likelihood of your trajectory, right? So we talked about policy gradient, right? So you essentially, you know, updating the parameter of your policy such that the resulting trajectory distribution put more probability math on those trajectories that have, that have high total reward, right? So that's the logic behind the policy gradient. And if you wanna estimate the policy gradient, you just sample one trajectory from this distribution, you know, execute that policy in the system, get a trajectory, and then, you know, just compute the expression, right? Using this one trajectory. So we know that this is an unbiased estimate of the policy gradient, right? So, you know, you all tried it out in the homework and at least it worked pretty well on uh, the problem cardboard. Right, but I noticed that some of you tried it out on another two environments. One is this Acrobot, the other one is this mountain car, right? And actually PG, the natural policy gradient that you implemented, it, it's gonna take a long time to succeed on these two environments. So what are the, the difference between these environments? Right, so the particular issue of policy gradient is that it lacks the ability to, to do exploration. So let's look at this car, mountain car example. So this is the mountain car example, right? So we start from the bottom, right? So this is our car. You have two actions left and the right, right? But we have reward zero almost everywhere, right? Except here. So we will have reward one here if you escape the valley. Right? But the car is designed such that if you start from the, the bottom and if you just full speed ahead, you will not be able to escape this valley because you know, there may be the push or whatever, the, the, the momentum on the car is not big enough. So the optimal strategy here is actually for the car to first you know, back up a little bit and then leverage this gravity, leverage this momentum, and then full speed ahead. So then you can escape this value, right? So this is a little bit tricky in the sense that you have to figure out a correct combination of actions, right? First to back up, up to some height, and then, you know, full speed ahead, right? You leverage these two, you know, energies so you can es escape this value. And then you get reward of one. Otherwise, you know, if you just wander around here, you get reward of zero. So what does this mean? Right, so this means that if you, start from a random policy, a policy that picks left and right uniform random, right? So without any prior knowledge of this environment, this is kind of, you know, the most natural initialization that we would pick, right? So if you start from such random policy, right? What's the probability that you can actually escape and succeed in this task? Right, so in this case, the probability is exponentially small, right? It's like, two to the negative h, where h is the number of steps in order to succeed, right? Because you, you, you rely on the randomness to sort of hit the exact combination of sequence of actions, right? In order to escape. So roughly the probability is tiny. So this means that if you compute the policy gradient of this random policy at the very beginning, right? So with high probability, this guy is always zero because you don't get reward unless you escape. Right, which means that your estimated policy gradient is always zero, 
Or in other words, the expected value of the policy grid, the, the true value of the policy grid is, is tiny because you only have little, little chance to hit the goal, to get a reward signal one. Otherwise you all get zero everywhere, right? So this is the problem because you give the algorithm a very, you know, a very common initialization, right? Because without any prior knowledge, like what we can do, you know, random policy is, is, is kind of, you know, the most natural initialization you would choose, right? So you pick that initialization and you start doing policy gradient and you find that your gradient is most of the time is zero, right? Because this policy cannot just hit the goal because it, it's very tricky to figure out the actions, right? That can hit the goal. So in this case, you know, a random policy is actually a pretty good locally optimal policy, right? So if a, if a random policy you're gonna walk around and get reward zero, and if you change the parameter a little bit, it's unlikely you're gonna escape, right? You're gonna get reward zero most of the time as well. So random policy is a pretty good policy in the sense of local optimality, in the sense that you, know, you look around, right? There's no obvious direction you could go to immediately improve your policy. Because no matter you know, what small step you do in the policy in the parameter, you're gonna get stuck in this, this valley again, right? So this is often called sparse reward problem because you don't get reward everywhere, right? You only get reward at the place where, you know, that is pretty far away from your initial state probably. Right, but asymptotically, eventually, you know, if you keep running policy gradient, right? Eventually you're gonna hit the goal after, you know, exponentially many trials, right? You're gonna hit the goal. So policy gradient or MPG eventually gonna succeed if you let it run for like, you know, one night or two nights. Right, but before you're hitting the goal, there's no signal for the policy gradient, right? Because like it just like it just gets zero everywhere. All right, so we can even dive into this more contrived example. This is simulating the mountain car example, right? So we call it combination lock. So let me explain this this Markov decision process, right? So we only have you know two chains, and this is S zero. We always start from S zero. Right? And we have reward one on this green note, and we have reward zero everywhere. Okay? And the length of the trajectory, the length of the chain is H. All right? And in the first kind of note, in this black note, you have two actions. One of the actions move you to a note to the, to the right note. The other action will move you to the red node, one of the red node, right? So this action move you right, this action move you to the red node. But as you can see here, once we stuck in the right node, right? We're gonna keep staying, like whatever action we talk, we're gonna keep staying in this red nodes, right? Which means that once we move to the red node, we're kind of stuck there because we are never gonna go back to the black nodes and eventually hit the, the reward. Okay, so the reason that we call it a combination lock is because every state starting from S0, you do need to pick the right action, right? One of the two actions in order to keep alive, meaning that staying on the top row, right? If you ever, you know, pick a wrong action somewhere in the middle, you're gonna be stuck in the red nodes where you're never gonna recover and get a reward one. Right, so you do have to hit the right combination of actions in order to hit the goal, the green node. So this is a very challenging problem, right? Because you're not allowed to make any mistake, you know? Once you make a mistake anywhere in the middle, you're just gonna stuck, right? Okay, so like what's the probability of a random policy, right? Can generate a trajectory that actually hits the goal. Right, so imagine, you know, again, without any prior knowledge of this environment, right? I start from policy gradient with a random policy that picks two actions with equal probability. That's a, you know, very reasonable initialization, right? So what's the probability of such policy actually generating a trajectory that hit the goal, right? So here it's even more clear, right? So this is two to the negative H, right? Because I needed to hit the correct action at every, time step, right? 
in order to hit the goal. Like I cannot make any mistake. So if you rely on randomness, you know, good luck, right? You 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 have exponential many, exponentially small chance to get a reward signal. Otherwise, you just get zero, right? Like if you get if you generate a bunch of trajectories, every demo all zero, like you cannot distinguish which one is good or not, right? Until you hit the goal, you can realize that, oh, this is a good sequence of actions, which gives me reward. So maybe I should, you know, bump up the probability of generating that act, that sequence of actions, right? But until you hit that goal, like everything looks equally good to you, right? So your policy gradient just gonna, you know, stay there without moving. Right, so I hope these two examples, you know, convince you that there is another very challenging problem called exploration in ARIA that we haven't really touched yet. Right, so our algorithm policy gradient is really relying on local information. Right, so if you're not, you know, dealing with this very contrived example, two examples that we talked about, then you're good. Right, think about this LQR uh, card pull problem. You get dense reward, right? Like you, you start from a very good place that is very close to your goal, right? And you get reward signal everywhere, right? And once you, you know, for, for, once your state is far off from the goal state, you get termination, right? So in this sense, the the card pull problem is not a sparse reward problem, right? You start from a very good place that is very close to the goal, and you get reward signal one one one, right? As long as you stay inside that good region. But the mountain card is opposite in the sense that you start from something that is very far away from the goal and you don't get any reward signal until you hit the goal. Right, so for these problems, for problems that have sparse reward, we needed to perform systematic exploration, right? So in the sense that we needed to remember where we visited and we needed to try to purposely visit some unexplored region in order to check if there's a, some gold there, right? Now we can always rely on randomness, right? Asymptotically, you know, randomness eventually gonna hit the goal, right? But that probably gonna take a long time. You know, if you have enough computational resources, if data, if data is very cheap for your problem, then yeah, you can still apply policy gradient methods, no problem, right? People use it quite often. Another way is to actually engineer the reward function. So if you're playing, you know, if you're playing video games, for instance, or playing board games, right? The most natural reward signal is the zero one loss, right? Zero means you lose the game, one means you win the game. But you have to wait until the end of the game in order to get that reward signal, right? So what people do is they actually engineer the reward. You can actually engineer the reward, you know, based on the pieces of, you know, the survived pieces on your board, right? So you can engineer that reward signal using a prior knowledge about the reward, about the game. And then, you know, you avoid this sparse reward problem. And your hope is that the reward that you designed is somehow at least positively correlated with the zero one loss, right? So that requires prior knowledge of the task. So without prior knowledge, you know, zero one loss is the most natural reward signal for a board game or any video game, right? Okay. As I said, you know, exploration in ARIO is important, but it's actually a very difficult problem. Right, so here I'm showing you one example where we, how we can design a reinforcement learning algorithm, especially a policy gradient based algorithm to explore such maze problem. So you start from here, right? And let's see, you know, you, you randomly pick a place for as an exit, right? So maybe here, and you wanted the agent to quickly explore the entire maze, right? And you can imagine for such complicated maze, if you do random walk, Right, a random policy. And the policy just gonna stay around the initial state, right? The probability of a random walk gonna hit an exit that is pretty far away from the start position is, is exponentially small again, right? But this plot is showing you that there's some algorithm that can actually you know, systematically explore this environment, right? So this algorithm first figures out, figured out policy pi. This is the first policy, figured out policy pi that generates such trajectory, right? And then it remembers that this part has already been explored and then it generates some future policies that generates this trajectory. 
right? And then the fifth policy further expands this trajectory. And then the 11th policy actually decides to explore a different corner because it realized that, you know, explore the bottom part pretty well already. And maybe the, the, the top corner, the left corner part, we haven't explored it yet, right? So maybe let's just try to explore there. And yeah, so you, if you do this many, many times and you hope this, this approach basically generates a policy to cover a particular region of the maze. And when you combine all these policies together, you get a sort of a uniform coverage over the entire maze, right? So once you explore the maze uniformly, then you're good, right? If I give you any exit, you will be able to find it very quickly because you know how to explore the entire maze at this moment, right? So exploration is a very active research area even today, right? So, but we will, like for this class, we will only talk about very simplified setting called multi unbanded and how to do exploration in MDP will actually be treated more deeply in the 6,000 level class, right? But we will get a favor, favor of you know, exploration in multi banding. Okay, so what we will do here is actually let's start study exploration in a very simple Markov decision process, right? So this is a Markov decision process that I have S0. My entire state space only have one state, S0, right? I only have K actions, A1 to AK, and my time step actually equal to one. I start at S0, I take action A from these K actions, then I stop, right? That's it. I'm only taking one action at this fixed state. So this is a very, very simple mock of decision process. You, know, you just need to make one step decision, that's it. Right? And every action has its own reward signal. Your goal is to figure out which action has the best reward signal, for instance, has the highest reward signal, has the highest expected reward, for instance. Right? So this problem is called multi amp bandits. Okay, so any questions so far for exploration in RL? Okay, great, let's move on. So but the plan for today is let's, uh, you know, quickly study the setting of Markov, uh, not Markov decision process, uh, multi arm bandits, right? And then let's give two attempts to solve this problem. The first one is our favorite algorithm, right? One of, you know, one of the simplest algorithms, a greedy approach. So we will see that this is actually a bad algorithm in this case, right? And then at attempt two is something called explore and commit meaning that you need to explore many actions before you know you make a decision. All right, so let's do the intro for MAB. So the setting is that we have this K many arms, A1 to AK, right? And people often use this example, this example to motivate, you know, this multi amp bandit. Imagine you enter, in, you enter into a casino, you have K slot missions, right? And you want to actually figure out, you know, which star machine gives you the highest reward. And you just want to, you know, try that machine over and over again, once you figure that out. So each arm in this case is a slot machine, right? And each arm has an unknown reward distribution, right? So we're going to use new I to represent the reward distribution of that particular arm. So this is a reward distribution that generate a reward signal from zero and one. Okay. We can assume that the reward is bounded, right? And we're gonna represent the mean of this arm as mu i. So each star machine, the way that it generates a reward signal is that it's sampled from an unknown fixed distribution, right? And has a reward, has a mean mu i. Now you wanna pick, you know, the machine that has the highest mean. Let's do an example, right? So AI, the arm I may have a Bernoulli distribution mu I, right? With mean equal to P. So what does this mean? This means that every time you pull the arm AI, we're gonna observe an ID reward R that is sampled from this Bernoulli distribution, right? In, the words, in other words, with probability P, we're gonna observe reward one, with probability one minus P, we're gonna observe reward zero, right? So imagine you enter into this casino, you saw this K, 
you know, slot machines, you decided to check the first one, right? So you pull the arm, you get a reward signal. And the reward signal is sampled from the underlying distribution designed for that machine, all right? Now you don't know the distribution, you don't know the reward mean. Your job is to quickly try out all these machines, you know, figure out the best one so that later on you can just keep pulling that arm, right? So that is the setting. It's a very simple mark of decision process. You know, you can think about it again as a mark of decision process that has a fixed state, right? No transition, K actions for that fixed state. And each action has its own reward distribution and reward mean. Okay, so even this setting is so simple, but the idea of bandits has been widely used even in practice, right? So whatever the recommendation system that you are experiencing every day, it probably uses this idea from multi-amp bandits, right? So one of the application is this online advertisement. So your goal is to recommend an ad in some platform to the user, right? And each arm here corresponds to a particular ad that you wanna you know, recommend or you wanna place on this website. Right? And each arm, each ad here has a click through rate, right? which is the probability of getting clicked if you propose this ad you know, to the user. Right? But of course you don't know this distribution, right? You, you don't know what's the distribution in, in the mind of a user, whether or not you know, she will click that ad or not, right? So we need to do experiment. So a typical goal for this system is actually to learn to maximize the click-through rate in the long run, right? So what does recommendation system do? So every day, they based on the prior history information, they figured out a new advertisement they're gonna suggest it to you, right? So this applies for any recommendation system. Maybe a mu music recommendation system decides to recommend this music for you, All right? So they showed you this and now, you will decide whether or not you're gonna click it, right? So if you click it, from the learning system's perspective, it observe a positive reward, what? Right, if you don't click it, then the reward is zero for that learning system, right? And now the job of the learning system is actually to update its underlying you know, recommendation algorithm or system or strategy, right? So that later on, maybe you can gradually recommend more and more relevant ads to users, right? So that's basically, the, this is a very fundamental setting that pretty much every you know, recommendation system in today, you know, they, they are using. Right? And more formally, we can, we can you know, formalize this interactive learning setting in the following for loop, right? From iteration t equal to zero to capital T minus one, you know, from day zero to day capital T minus one, right? Every day, the learning system pulls an arm, IT, from these K arms, right? So here I am using IT to represent the index one to capital K. So we have K actions in total, K arms in total, right? So I'm pulling the arm I subscript T, right? And once I tried this arm, so this, you could potentially do this based on all the history information that you have so far, right? So you're probably gonna update your strategy of pulling arm you know, based on the information that you have in your hand. And once you pull this arm, you're gonna observe an ID reward signal RT that is sampled from this arm's distribution, right? So remember each arm has its own distribution in UI, right? So if I tried arm index IT, I'm gonna observe a reward from that arm's distribution. All right, so this reward is ID sampled from this unknown distribution, unknown fixed distribution. All right, then we repeat. Right, so this is you know an online interacting interactive system that is you know for instance interacting with the user every day. Okay, so here one thing that I want to emphasize is that each iteration we do not observe rewards of arms that we did not try, right? 
So this is a this makes the problem much harder. You try this advertisement, you observe whether or not user click it, right? But you don't know what would happen if you tried other ads, right? Like maybe there's a, there's a better advertisement that if you place that, you know, user gonna click it there always, right? You don't know that. Or on the other extreme case, maybe this is actually the best advertisement that you could do, right? But you also don't know that. So do you need to explore in terms of trying different advertisement in the future? Or should you just commit to you know, the current advertisement that you, you already, you, know, you, you kind of believe that is good enough, right? Every day, you know, the system needs to ask himself this question, right? Like, should I try something new today? Or should I commit to you know, the best advertisement that I have so far, right? The best arm that I have so far. So this is precisely the exploration and exploitation dilemma, right? Okay, any questions about the setting? All right, so, so let's talk about you know, the objective, right? So this is a learning objective. So let's define regret as the difference between two terms. So here mu star is the largest you know, the, the, the mean of the best arm, right? The best arm means an arm whose reward mean is the highest, right? I'm interested in identifying an arm whose reward mean is the highest, right? The expected reward is the highest, right? So the first term, what is this first term? The first term means that the total expected reward that we would have got if we put this best arm over this capital T many rounds. So this is the best you could do. Imagine you enter this casino and you know that that arm has the maximum highest you know, reward of me. You're just going to try that mission over and over again for T many rounds, right? So this is the, the maximum expected reward that you would get. So what about the second term? The second term is the expected total reward that we got, right? This is the, the ex total expected reward on the arms that we tried through this game, right? from round zero to round capital T minus four, right? So IT is the arm that we tried at iteration T, right? So the first term is tracking the best that we could do if we had access to all the information, right? The second term is tracking what we actually got, you know, by playing this game, right? by doing this interactive you know, learning process. So of course, our goal is to minimize this regret, right? So the goal is to actually be no regret in the sense that the average regret, regret over capital T approach to zero as T approach to infinite, right? So our hope is that you know, when we do more and more interactions, we gradually figure out the best arm, right? Or at least in your near optimal arms so that later on we can pull more and more frequently on these good arms so that the regret is tiny. You know, maybe at the very beginning, we're gonna pay larger regret, right? Because we don't know anything about the environment. But maybe if we can quickly figure out the best arm, then we commit to do that best arm, we will do very well in the long run, right? So that is the goal for this setting. Okay, so now I briefly mentioned this already. So why the problem is actually hard, right? So this is a simple problem. Like why are we studying this problem actually? So there's actually this exploration and exploitation trade-off, right? So every day, you know, we ask ourselves, right? Should I pull arms that are less frequently tried in the past? Right? So this means, should I explore, right? Because I don't know, maybe there's some other arm that I haven't tried that many times yet. Maybe that arm is good, right? I should try them more to get more, you know, samples in order to support my evidence that this arm is good, right? Or should we should we should I just commit it to the current best arm? You know, the current best means that you know, based on the history information you have about all the pulled arms, this is the best one that you can estimate. Right? Should we should we exploit? You know, we have a time budget, right? We can only do this game capital T many rounds. So we can't just explore everywhere, right? We're gonna waste many, many rounds. And we don't want to commit it too early because we might miss chance of discovering a really good arm, right? Due to, you know, we haven't tried it that many times.
times yet. Right? Remember, every arm has a distribution, right? So we needed to try it several times in order to get a good you know, estimation of the mean, right? Before we can see anything. So this is actually pretty challenging, right? Uh, yes, question? Um, so is the number of arms that we have um, larger than the total number of rounds we can play? Or is that- No, so let's assume, let's assume K is smaller than capital T. Okay. Yeah, so T is usually a much larger number than, than K. Right, but again, you know, I want to emphasize that this is not deterministic game, right? In the sense that you pull in an arm, you're only going to observe a sample of the reward signal. Right, if everything is deterministic, yes, pull each arm once, you're done, right? You know, after the first K iterations, you get a perfect, you know, you get a perfect answer about, you know, the, the, the means of each arm, right? But the problem is that there's a randomness here, right? It's not deterministic game. Okay, so that's the intro part for multi-arm bandits, right? So hopefully, you know, I convinced you that this very simple setting is actually useful in practice. And there's some challenging problem that we need to, you know, think about in order to solve this problem. All right, so any questions about the first part? Okay, great. So let's, let's dive into this attempt one, right? So this greedy algorithm. Okay, so the algorithm is very simple. I have K actions, I have K arms. Let's try each arm once and then commit to the one that has the highest observed reward. Right? So very simple. For the first K rounds, every round I'm trying this arm, right? I record down the observed reward. You know, at, starting from the K plus one round, I'm just going to pick an arm that has the highest observed reward. So this is a very simple, you know, maybe the first thing that you would try, right? This is a very greedy algorithm. All right, let's, what could be wrong? All right, so, so this is a bad algorithm, I can tell you. So can you guess, you know, what, what could be wrong here for this algorithm? So arm that gives you the highest reward in those K trials may not necessarily be the optimally best arm because it's probabilistic. So yeah, there's a chance yes. that you pull yes. the arm that's not the best. Yes, yes, exactly. So one thing that I want to remind you is that reward is sampled from the distribution, right? So we don't know the distribution. We only get to see the observed, you know, the sample reward, right? That does not really mean that this is going to equal to the mean of the reward distribution, right? So a bad arm that has low mean may generate a high reward, right? By chance, you know, who knows, right? You know, you flip a very biased coin, coin right? With some probability, you're going to observe, you know, either side, right? So let's be be more concrete, right? So let's see, we, we, have, we have these two arms, A1 and A2. Both of them have Bernoulli distribution, right? So A1 says that with probability 60%, my reward is one and otherwise zero. And A2 says that with probability 40%, my reward is one and else is zero, All right? Both of them are Bernoulli distribution. The first one has parameter 0 0.6. The second one has parameter 0 0.4, right? So the expected reward mu1 is, 0.6, mu2 is 0 0.4, right? So clearly, A1 is a better arm, right? But what if you try A1 once and try A2 once? So with probability 16%, which is 0 0.4 times 0 0.4, right? We will observe a pair of reward that is equal to 0 and 1, because with probability 40, percent, right? We're going to observe R1 equal to zero. And with probability of 40%, we're going to observe R2 equals to one, right? By these probability distributions. Okay, so now your greedy algorithm will pick A2 starting from the third round, which means that you're going to lose expected reward 0 0.2 
starting from the third round all the way to the end, right? So you're gonna lose 0 0.2 times capital T minus two. So this is a linear regret, right? So divided by capital T, this is equal to 0 0.2 in the limit, right? So this is no good. Every round in expectation, no matter how many you tried in the future, you're losing 0 0.2, a constant regret, right? So no good. All right, so this attempt is failed. Now let's go to the attempt two. So this is a slightly smarter algorithm. Right? So this is called explore and commit. So we're gonna look into the algorithm and then we're gonna do some analysis for that one. Okay, so what lessons we learned from the greedy algorithm, right? So due to randomness in the reward distribution, trying each arm once is not enough. Right, because you may observe a very good reward signal for a very bad arm by some chance. Right? And in other words, the observed single reward may be very, very far away from the mean of the distribution. And here, again, a question for you all. So what potentially could be a fix here? Could you do it multiple times and like pick the average? Yes, that's exactly what we're gonna do, All right? So let's try each arm multiple times, compute the empirical mean of each arm, and then commit to the one that has the highest empirical mean, right? Remember, you know, we have our friend, right? Which is called law of large number in the sense that if you try many, many times, we take the average, this average is gonna converge to the mean, right? So we know that. You know, hopefully, you know, after we take reasonable amount of times, trials on each arm, we get a very good estimation of the mean, right? And then we can commit to the one that has the highest estimated mean, right? And hopefully that gives us good result in the end. But the question is that how many times is, is enough? Or how many times is good, right? We don't want to, again, we don't want to spend too many rounds on exploration, right? because we might try too many times on a bad arm so that we lose regret, right? Every time we try in a bad arm, we lose a regret, right? So we don't wanna to spend too much time on exploring, right? We wanna explore at the right level so that we can just commit to the best one. So that's the challenging part for analyzing this algorithm, right? But for now, let's look at this framework, the algorithm framework, right? So the algorithm only has one hyperparameter, which is N. This is the number of times we will try each arm. So let's assume capital T is much larger than K in the sense T over K is bigger than you know, M. All right, so the algorithm is very simple. The first phase is the exploration phase. For all arm K equal to one to capital K, Let's pull this arm k n times, and we observe n i d sampled reward signals from this distribution u k. Right, so I'm just focusing on this arm k. I try to k many n many times. Right, every time I observe a reward signal, so I get an n reward signal at the end. Let's compute the average. I'm summing these n rewards together divided by capital N, I get an average mu hat k. Right? So our hope is that this approach to mu k as n approach to infinite. So that is true because we know, you know, based on the law of large number, right? Right, and once we're done, once we're done with the exploration phase, we're just gonna do the exploitation phase, right? So for T starting from NK to capital T minus one. Remember we use the first NK rounds for exploration, right? All right, so starting from NK, we're just gonna do exploitation. 
So the reason that we start from NK is because we always start from time index zero. So, but it's, it's, not, it's not super important, yeah. All right, so you're just gonna pull the best empirical arm, meaning that the arm whose index is actually equal to the arg max, right, over I from K, and the empirical mean, you had I. So we have empirical mean for every arm, Let's just pick an arm whose empirical mean is the highest, right? Let's trust our empirical mean at this moment. You know, hopefully we have already averaged over multiple rounds. It, it maybe when n is big, you know, our mean estimation is really good, right? So let's trust these mean estimations and pick the one that has the highest mean, empirical mean, and then just commit to that. So the algorithm is very simple, right? Two phases, exploration and exploitation. Now the question is that what's the best n that we can set in order to minimize the regret of this whole algorithm, right? So obviously we cannot set n to be too big because we're just gonna do waste too many rounds for exploration, right? We also don't wanna set n equal to one. That's the example that we saw in the attempt one, right? The greedy algorithm set n equal to one. So we know that this is bad. Okay, so let me just write down another extreme case where n equals to t over k, right? So this is bad because you're spending t over k many rounds of trying a potentially very bad arm, right? So this means the regret is roughly gonna be k, t over k times maybe mu star minus, you know, a mu bad, right? because you at least are gonna spend capital T over K many rounds for a, a, a bad arm, right? So this is roughly like constant. So this is already not a, a, a no regret algorithm, right? Because if you divide it by T, you get like mu star minus mu bad over K. So you get constant regret, right? So you don't wanna spend too many rounds on a, in a, on a bad arm, right? Because Whenever, whenever you try a bad arm, you lose regret and you start minus new bad, right? Won't it be like okay, so. we are try, trying um, K minus one bad arms in that case, right? Like because there's technically only one best arm. Yeah. So won't it be like K minus one times that? Yeah, yeah, you're right. Uh, so so what this, the, 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 what the regret would be, right? So maybe, so I'm just so here I'm just demonstrating that you're gonna suffer linear regret, but if you do more carefully, if you do things more carefully, yes, that's 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 roughly what you said, right? So we have mu one to mu k. So let's just just assume without loss of generality, this is mu star. My first arm is mu star, right? So this means that I'm spending t over k rounds on mu two, where I will suffer mu one minus mu two, right? So if I pull mu two t over k many times, I'm gonna suffer this regret, right? So I will suffer t over k mu one minus mu three, so on so forth, plus t over k mu one minus mu k, right? So that, that's, what it, that's what you said, right? Yeah, so this is yeah. a constant yeah. regret. Yeah, right? That makes sense, thanks. Yeah, so on both extreme cases, you know, n equal to one, it's not so good. When n is big, it's also not so good, right? So there's some sweet spot in the middle. And the question is, you know, how we set n, right? So that we minimize the regret of this problem, of this algorithm. Okay, so any questions about the algorithm for now? Okay, great. So now let's jump into the analysis. Okay. So we're gonna use some off-shelf statistical tools, right? So you've already saw such kind of inequalities when we were talking about, you know, um, a model-based reinforcement learning approach, right? Where we, you know, reset to a particular state many, many times, get a sample average. And we were talking about there, you can build a confidence ball around the transition, right? 
And we know that with some high probability, you know, your ground truth model is going to force into this confidence pool. Right, so in other words, we're going to use a slightly more advanced technique than, you know, row of large number, for instance. Row of large number just says that, you know, set your n to be infinite, you will be good, right? But this is not a very satisfying answer because sometimes we want to know that if I set n to be 100, what I can say about my estimation, right? So this Hoftin inequality gives you this ability to say something more than row of large number. Right? So we're talking about something like, if I have a distribution u that is from, you know, always sample a point from zero and one, right? And I sample r1, rn from this distribution u in the id fashion, right? So what I'm interested in is, let's denote mu hat as r1 plus rn, R2 all the way to Rn over N. So this is our sample average, right? So the question that we are interested to answer is, what's the difference between these two quantities, right? Where mu is the expectation, right? So what's the deviation, right? From our estimated mean to the ground truth mean, right? We know that this deviation is going to converge to zero if n approach to infinite. You know that's our, you know, one of our favorite friends. You know, law of large number tells us, right? But you know, this new friend, Hofstede inequality, is going to tell us how far they are from each other in terms of the number of trials n. So particularly if you remember that magic number, so this will be less than roughly ignoring constant and log terms. So this will be roughly one over n. Right, so we have seen this magic number one over n, square root one over n many times already, right? Okay, so let's formalize this statement, right? So given a distribution mu, mu, right? And n i d samples are subscript i, where i from one to n from this distribution mu, then with probability one minus delta, so delta is a number from zero and one, right? So think about delta as a small number. For example, 0 0.01, right? Then we will have this inequality. This is our sample mean, and this is our ground truth mean, right? So ignoring constants, this is shrinking in the order of square root log of one over delta over capital N. So you can actually, you know, to get a good sense about this bound, right? So maybe set delta equal to 0 0.01 and a log of 100 is, I think roughly a constant five or six or something, right? So which means in this case, with probability 99%, so you're confident up to the level of 99%. Right, so mu hat minus mu is roughly going to be less than, ignoring constant, five or maybe six over capital N, right? Because log of 100 is a small number, right? You take a log of a one over delta, right? Now, if there's no log, then we're going to be in trouble, right? Because we're going to be something like square root of 100 over N, but we have log, right? So taking log on a large number, you know, just roughly, log roughly grows like a constant, right? So that's why, you know, in theory, in, in, in theoretical computer science or whatever, we don't really care log too much because log, like think about the, the plot of the log curve, right? It's almost flattened, right? When, when, the, when the X becomes big, right? So it behaves like a constant because the growth rate is very small. So that's why we often ignore the log terms as well. And that's how we that's that's why we use this big O tilde notation, which is a notation that ignores you know log terms. So big O notation is a notation ignoring constant, absolute constant. And then there's this big O tilde, which further ignores the log terms. Right? Because in theory, you know, we often just be very sloppy on log terms. We treat log terms as a constant. Because the growth rate of the log function is 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 so tiny, right? Okay, so 
picture-wise, this gives us a confidence interval, right? So this is my sample mean, mu hat. Now I have a bar, right? On the top of the bar, I have this up confidence bound, which is the sample mean plus the deviation, right? And the bottom of the bar, I have the lower confidence, right? Which is the sample mean minus the, the deviation, one over square root n, right? Square root of one over n. And I know that with probability at least one minus delta, right? My ground truth mu, this green dot, is somewhere inside this bar, right? And with the rest of the probability, delta, this confidence interval is not going to capture mu, mu, the ground truth mu. But with probability one minus delta, it falls inside this interval, right? So picture-wise, this is what Hoff inequality is telling us, right? With a very high probability, you know, probability 99%, I know that this green dot falls into this interval. Where it is, I have no idea, right? I just know that it falls into this interval. But with the rest of the small probability, yes, this interval is going to be invalid, right? But that's just small probability. All right, so this is a tool that we're going to use, right? So no need to memorize these uh these these numbers i right? don't no need to memorize and whenever you need to use that just you know wiki it or google it right um but just remember there's a, some tool that is stronger you know more powerful than law of large number right that tells us you know how you can quantify the deviation from your estimation and the ground truth right in terms of the number of trials right and and the deviation often grows in the rate of you know square root of one over n, where n the number of trials. This magic, you know, square root of one over n number. Okay, great. Another tool that we're gonna use is this union bound. So this you know connects a little bit to the discrete mass that you, you all learned, right? So the probability of event A or B, so you have two events A and B. So you care about the probability of you know either A happens or B happens. So the probability of this A or B is going to be less than probability of A happens and plus probability B happens. Right? So picture-wise, I have A and B, right? So the area of this A or B is going to less than the area plus area B, right? Because A or B, they might have joint. Right, so they have this non-empty join overlapping. Right, so that's the intuition behind this. Right, because there's some probability that A and B, they're going to happen at the same time, right? And you can extend this to more than two events. You can do K events, right? So the intuition is still the same. You know, these K events, they may have overlapping. So the area of, you know, the all of these k events going to be less than the sum of each event's area, right? So what I'm saying is that a1 or a2 or ak right, is less than sum over i equal to 1 to k of p a i. Right? Again, the intuition is that these events, they have overlapping. Okay, so with these two tools, we can get to the following result, right? So for after the exploration phase, with probability at least one minus delta for all arm, i from one to capital K, we will have the following confidence interval. So here, apologize for my notation. Right, so the first term is our estimated mean of the arm i. The second term is the ground truth mean of the arm i. Right, so we have a log k, log k term appears up. Um, so you don't need to worry about the, all these details. So I'm just you know telling you the truth after we combine the Hofstede inequality and the union bound. Right, so now we have a claim that for all arm i equal to one to capital k, 
we have a valid confidence interval for it. And these confidence interval holds simultaneously for all these arms, right? So in other words, picture-wise, what do we have? So if you had three arms, this is the picture that we have, right? So after the exploration phase, using these two off-shelf statistical tools, we get to this conclusion, right? So we have a confidence interval, this bar for each arm, right? So this is arm one, arm two, arm three, right? So each of them, they have their a confidence interval. The confidence interval is centered at the estimated mean, which is mu hat i here, right? And the length of the confidence interval is two times this deviation bound, right? Square root log over n. So again, you know, it's very safe for us to ignore. Like, it's, it's totally fine to ignore the log terms, right? So this is the, the confidence interval's length is roughly two times, you know, square root of one over n, right? So at this stage, with high probability, we have valid confidence intervals for each arm, right? We know that mu one, mu two, or mu three, they're gonna fall inside, you know, their own confidence interval. We don't know where it is, but we know that it's somewhere inside the confidence interval. Right, so this is the consequence that we got from using off-shelf statistical techniques. I'm not doing any fancy stuff. I'm just applying, you know, the Hofstede inequality, the union bound. Right. So if you want to see how we get to this stage, check the reading material. Right, check the reading reading material in terms of how we combine the Hofstede inequality and the union bound to get a claim that I have confidence intervals for all arm and they are valid simultaneously. Okay, so any questions about, you know, building the confidence intervals for each arm? Right, so, so now intuitively, right? When my N is really big, the confidence interval is shrinking, right? So if N is approached to infinite, then the confidence interval just gonna concentrate on the ground truth mean, right? So at that stage, you know, our mean estimation mu hat and the ground truth mu, they're gonna be arbitrarily close, right? So that's why you know we hope there's some sweet spot that we can we can you know commit it to in terms of setting n, right? So that the algorithm eventually gives us a very good regret. Okay, so in the rest, we will just condition it on the high probability event that the confidence intervals are all valid, right? We know that with high probability, all these confidence intervals they are valid simultaneously for all r. Right? And with small probability, yes, they're gonna fail. So at the end of the day, we just kind of claim that our algorithm with high probability gonna give us a very good regret. But yes, with probability, you know, delta, tiny probability, we're gonna fail. So if that fails, we don't have any guarantee, right? So in other words, our final statement will be high probability as well. So we will say that with probably 99%, we're gonna succeed. With probability 1%, yes, I, I don't know. Our algorithm might gonna fail. So that's the statement that we're gonna do. Right, so starting from now, we're just going to commit to the event that you know all the confidence intervals are valid. Right, we know that the probability that it's not valid is tiny, right? And we don't care about that tiny probability for now. Okay, good. So we have this three confidence intervals for three arms, right? So let's just imagine this is the situation that we got after we do the exploration phase, right? So what the algorithm will commit to. So the algorithm will commit to this arm, right? Because mu hat to two is larger than both mu hat one and mu hat three, right? So this looks pretty bad because the optimal arm here is mu three, right? So this is mu star. But we are committing to a bad arm. Right, so in other words, we're gonna suffer regret capital T minus NK times the regret of pulling arm two, right? So if I pull arm two at this round, the regret will be mu three minus mu two because mu three in this case is the optimal arm. 
All right, so even if you do this, you know, we still gonna have some chance that committing to a wrong arm, right? But the nice thing is that looking at this case, right? The difference between mu two and mu three, the gap between mu two and mu three, it's not that big, right? Particularly the gap should be less than the length of the confidence interval, right? So from this picture, it's very clear, right? So mu three minus mu two, this gap is less than, you know, the confidence interval length, right? Which we know is shrinking in the order of one over n, one over square root n. So it's not too bad. Yes, we will potentially commit to a round arm, but the regret at this stage we are paying is tiny already, right? Per round. So let's see if we can formalize this idea. Okay, good. So now let's denote the empirical best arm as I hat, right? So this is the best arm you're gonna commit it to after you do the exploration phase, right? Based on your empirical estimation. So this is our estimation, right? And the best one is the ground truth, right? So I star is the best one and I hat is our guess the best one. All right, they might be equal, they might not be equal as we saw from the previous slides, right? So what is the worst possible regret in the exploration phase, right? Remember our algorithm has two phases, right? So it's very natural to, to analyze each phase first, right? So let's analyze the first phase, the exploration phase. So here's a question for you. What's the worst possible get, regret in the exploration phase, right? Just be very, you know, you can be very sloppy on constant whatever, just, you know, make a guess about the worst possible regret. Yes. Uh, K-N. Correct. Yes, very good. So it will be like N times K minus one because one of the arm is optimal. But as I said, you know, let's be very sloppy on this. We will be fine, right? So I'm gonna further up bound it N times capital K minus one by N K. Right, because our reward is bounded from zero one, right? So the maximum per round regret that you're gonna get is one, right? So let's just be very, you know, let's just reason the worst possible case, right? We just lose in the entire regret during the exploration phase. So we're just gonna pay n times capital K. We, we can't pay a worse regret than nk, right? This is the worst we can get. All right, so what's the regret in the exploitation phase? Right? Someone wanna give a try? Okay, so let oh. me just write it. Oh, okay, fine. Then. Yeah. Okay, so what is the regret afterwards, right? So every round I'm gonna commit it to head I. So I'm gonna pay mu I star minus mu head I, right? And how many times I'm gonna pay this regret, right? Capital T minus NK rounds, because these are the number of exploitation rounds, right? So this is the regret that I'm gonna pay in the exploitation phase, right? So the total regret is just a sum of these two terms, right? So now let's just uh, focusing on refining this bound. So let's refine the, the regret corresponding to exploitation phase. So this one, we are good. There's not that much we could do, right? But the second one we have, we need to do some math in order to you know, get a sense of how good that is, right? So remember, this two, our hope is that there's the gap between these two is small, right? Remember the picture that we showed, right? We are committing to a round arm, but the hope is that the gap between mu star and the mu head i is small, right? The, the gap between these two numbers, they should be small, as small as the confidence interval, right? So we will see in the next slide. But if you recall the previous picture, right? So this is what I'm saying mu three minus mu two, the gap should be smaller than the length of the confidence interval, right? So they shouldn't be too big. So let's see if we can formalize this idea, right? So just very simple, two lines, All right? So let's start from here, right? Mu i star minus mu head i. So what is this? This is the upper confidence bound for, for i star, right? So I know that, mu i star 
belongs to mu hat i star minus you know, roughly this one over n and mu hat i star plus one over n. Correct? You know, this is the confidence interval, right? And I know that mu hat i is also falls into this confidence interval, right? It's own confidence interval. Right, so I'm just upper bounding mu i star using its own up confidence bound, and I'm lower bounding mu hat i using its low confidence bound, right? So good, now we get this quantity, right? The difference between the empirical mean mu hat i star, right? And mu hat i hat plus two times, you know, one over square root of n, right? So this is the length of our confidence interval, right? Okay, so now the last equation is that this is just less than the length of the confidence interval. And here's a question for you, why? Why this inequality holds? Because I star is the best empirical estimate that you can get. So the difference between the two estimates is gonna be um, positive, wait, hold on, be negative, right? Yeah, so remember the definition of I hat, right? I hat is the arm that achieves the highest empirical mean, right? Which means mu hat I hat should be bigger than mu hat I star, right? Because I hat is the one that achieves the highest empirical mean. Like it can be worse than, you know, any other arms empirical mean, right? So just by definition, right? So which means this quantity is at least, you know, it, it will not be, be bigger than zero, right? Because that otherwise that violates our definition of I hat, right? Okay, good. So we basically, you know, confirmed our intuition, right? The difference between the mu I star and mu hat I, it is at the most the length of the confidence interval, right? Which is two times square root of one over n. So that is good. You know, now we can conclude that this regret is upper bounded by capital T times the confidence interval length, right? So I'm very sloppy here. I'm even ignoring this nk, right? So I'm just upper bound this term by k, by t. So now t times the confidence interval length, right? So we get this expression. Right? So if you want to be sloppy, you can ignore the constant in log terms. This is roughly like t times one over n. Okay, good. Now let's combine them together. Uh, I am, okay. Sorry about this. There should be animation, but I think at this stage, everything should be simple, right? So there's a two here. So let's just combine these two, right? So we have nk in the first phase, and we have t times square root one over n in the second phase, right? So this is our upper bound for any particular n. So in order to make our life good, we needed to minimize our upper bound, right? So we can minimize the upper bound. Like let's make the regret as small as possible by optimizing n, right? So the, one, the way you can do this is take the gradient of this expression with respect to n, set it to zero, solve for n, that's your optimal solution of n to minimize this expression, right? Again, the high level logic is that we get a regret expression for every n, right? But what is our goal, right? Our goal is to tune the parameter n such that the regret is as small as possible, right? So this maps to the problem of optimizing n such that this expression is minimized, right? And we know how to do that, setting gradient, computer gradient, set gradient to zero, so for n, right? So if you do that, you're gonna get this expression. And if you, Ignoring the complicated of this expression, right? This expression is just coming out from this gradient computation. And once you're plugging this expression into this formulation, something, you know, nice actually happens, right? So this is our regret that we get, which is t to the two over three times k to one over three, right? Plus some log terms, times some log terms, but you can safely ignore that. All right, so let me, let me just summarize this. So for any delta from zero to one, right? 
if I set the hyperparameter n to be this number of times trying each arm, right? So set n to be this complicated number. You know, you don't need to remember this number whatsoever, right? This is just a number that calculate from uh, by optimizing the expression, right? Then with probability, at least one minus delta, this algorithm explore and commit has the following very nice regret, right? Specifically, the regret grows in the rate of capital T to the power of two over three, right? So which means that regret capital T over T is roughly equals to T to the power of negative one over three times K over three, which approach to zero as T approach to infinite. Right, so we achieve that goal, right? So we get an algorithm that is no regret by tuning the parameter n. Right, so you can literally implement this algorithm, right? Because k is known, capital T is known. So you can just set n and run the algorithm, right? This is a very simple algorithm. And it will guarantee you that with probability one minus delta, you will succeed in terms of getting this regret bound. With the rest of the probability, yes, we don't know, right? Because the confidence interval gonna gonna fail. You know, the analysis is not, not gonna hold, right? But at least with high probability, we can conclude that we can we we will succeed. All right, so let's let me just summarize the two steps in the analysis, right? The first step, use off-shelf, you know, statistical tools, right? So we get confidence intervals for all arms that holds simultaneously. So in picture wise, we have this three confidence interval, right? So this is the ground truth. And we have this confidence interval valid in the sense that, you know, the ground truth mean falls into somewhere inside this confidence interval, right? Good. And now in the, in the example above, we will commit to arm two, unfortunately, which is a wrong arm, right? But we're gonna pay iteration per iteration regret mu three minus mu two. And what we just convinced ourselves by using three lines of derivation, right? So this is actually less than the length of the confidence interval, right? So in other words, from this picture, but right, at least we can already see that mu three minus mu two is less than the length of the confidence interval, which is roughly around square root one over n, right? So with these two, you know, points in your head, you should be able to, you know, automatically generate the entire proof, reproduce the entire proof, right? So this part, we did not go into the details because, you know, it's a little bit out of the scope of this class, right? So, but you just need to remember there, there are more powerful tools like Hofstede inequality for us to use in order to get a confidence interval, right? In order to reason how far away our estimation is away is from the ground truth in terms of number of samples, right? Law of large number doesn't tell you that. It just tells you that asymptotically, you know, your estimation will approach to the ground truth. But this one tells us, tells you that how far away they could be from each other, right? Okay, so that's all I wanna cover for today. And the on Thursday's lecture, we will talk about a slightly more advanced algorithm, right? And because this algorithm, we get rate of T to, two over three, and the optimal rate should be square root t, right? So on Thursday, we will talk about an algorithm. We will briefly talk about an algorithm that achieves this square root capital T regret. All right? So